Welcome to the Colonial Society of Massachusetts and our first annual Donald Friary Lecture. The Colonial Society was formed in 1892 to study, to promote the study of early American history. And it began with members of the society reading papers on various topics they had researched. And tonight is very much in that tradition where we have three of our members who will be presenting on a topic that is of great interest to all of us. And before we do that though, I'm going to introduce Donald Priory. This lecture series, which will be an annual lecture was created in honor of Don Priory, who is the Colonial Society's longest serving president. He served for 14 years as president of the Colonial Society sponsoring programs like this to help make the Colonial Society a more active presence in the world of American history. Don came to the Colonial Society after 37 years at Historic Deerfield, which he transformed into a sleepy collection of 17th century houses into a real powerhouse for research scholarship, as well as visitors. So I'm really pleased and honored to be able to introduce our President Emeritus, Don Friary, to say a few words. Please unmute yourself, Don. Don, you'll have to unmute yourself. Don, Don, you're muted. Mute button is... There it is. The bottom of oh, the screen. That's Lower left. Microphone down in the lower left. There you go. Yeah. There now, go. there you are. Can you Don. hear me? You're well, on. Thank you, Don. Yes. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Bob, and good evening to everyone. I am flattered and honored and grateful to the uh, Council of the Colonial Society for having this new annual lecture program named in honor of my 14 year tenure as president of the society. When I was elected in 2006, one of my principal goals was to expand the society's offerings to our membership and to the public. From its inception in 1892, the society has had three stated meetings every year for the presentation and discussion of French research on Massachusetts history. Since 1999, we have each year convened a graduate student forum to bring younger scholars together to present their dissertations and progress. To engage the interest and commitment of our membership and of other scholars and enthusiasts for early American history, I recommended to the council that we have additional programs to present our own Colonial Society publications and new books by members. These events have fostered engagement in new approaches to understanding early American studies and have also brought our members and many others to our magnificent 1806 Charles Bullfinch designed house at 87 Mount Vernon Street on Beacon Hill. I'm happy that our new president, Bob Allison, is presenting all these programs via Zoom during the current pandemic. I understand that when we are back to normal or perhaps to a new normal, all these Colonial Society programs will be accessible both live at the Society's house and on Zoom. We all look forward to that. <clears throat> I thank the council and our entire Colonial Society membership for your encouragement and support during my tenure. I look forward to Bob Allison's leadership and new directions in the coming years. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. And let me also remind everyone that our publications are also available on our website, everything from 1892 to the present. 
And our format tonight will be each of our speakers will have about 10 minutes to discuss some aspect of the Salem witch trials, and then we will open it to discussion among them. And members of the audience who wish to ask a question, please put it in the chat and I will do my best to monitor them and ask the, uh, the I know these three individuals have a lot to say, so I'm looking forward to hearing them. And I will introduce them severally and then specifically as each one comes to speak, we have Emerson Tad Baker from Salem State, Mary Beth Norton from Cornell University and Ben Ray from the University of Virginia. And so we are going to open it up with um, Tad Baker, who is a vice pro provost, as well as a professor of history at Salem State. He's also served as dean of their graduate school. And he has written or co-written six books on the history and archaeology of early New England, including A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Trials and the American Experience, and The Devil of Great Island, Witchcraft and Conflict in Early New England. He's also co-developed four historical iPhone apps, including Salem Witch Trials. And Tad serves as the chair of the Maine Cultural Affairs Council and the Maine Humanities Council. And currently he is the vice chair of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. His current book project explores material life in 17th century New England. So please welcome Tad Baker. Thanks, Bob. What a wonderful evening. This is just really so exciting to be here. I'm pleased and honored to be here amongst good friends to celebrate Don Friary's truly exemplary service as president of the Colonial Society. With this inaugural, inaugural lecture, or in this case, I guess, uh, inaugural conversation in his honor. You know, new books and new voices still add to the story of the Salem Witch Trials and are going to continue to do so. Meanwhile, though, some of us <clears throat> slightly older voices, shall I say, uh, keep thinking of things maybe we wish we could have included in our books, because as we all know, you can only do so much in one book, and there are bookshelves worth of books on the Salem Witch Trials. So as an archaeologist, uh, I really want to focus tonight on, on one thing, the need to better understand the material lives and material culture of the people of the Salem Witch Trials. I did try to work on some material culture in A Storm of Witchcraft, as well as its predecessor, The Devil of Great Island, um, I particularly thank Richard Trask for kindly showing me artifacts and the plans of excavation from his Salem Village Parsonage dig so I could reconstruct what it looked like when the Paris family lived there. And I managed to include a bit on the material culture of protective magic, ranging from shoes and horseshoes to hexafoils, also known as daisy wheels. Indeed, a protective hexafoil carved into the doorway of my circa 1795 house uh, graces the front of Storm of Witchcraft. But I knew this quite literally just scratched the surface. Now I should point out that the British are decades ahead of us here, going back to Ralph Merrifield's 1987 book, The Archaeology of Ritual and Magic, as well as more recent important work by Brian Hoggard, Timothy Easton, Owen Davies, and, and many more scholars. Still, I would point out that the Americans are catching up in the past decade with the work of folks like Chris Fennell, Chris Manning, and most notably, I would say, uh, Riley Auger, whose recent book, The Archaeology of Magic, Gender and Domestic Protection in 17th Century New England, is something I think you will want to read. So thanks to all of this work, we now realize that a shoe found in a wall next to a hearth is protective magic against evil spirits coming down the chimney. With the form and smell of a person, it is supposed to trick the spirit into entering the shoe and thus capturing it. Apparently spirits couldn't turn around, I guess, I'm not sure, but apparently it worked. Similarly, a number of things carved near openings of houses, the windows, doors, the chimneys, uh, were meant to protect against evil and to keep it out. And here again, I'm talking about things like hexafoils, Marian marks, and so-called demon traps. And a bottle filled with straight pins and urine, usually of the afflicted person, is much more than that. It's a witch bottle to ward off witches or perhaps cause harm to them. However, I would, I, I would insist that there's still a lot of work to be done here. So I'm now back on a project I first began several decades ago, a book on material life in 17th century New England. 
Now, those of you who know me will not be surprised to hear this, but much of this work focuses on what I call the other New England, Maine and New Hampshire. In contrast to the Puritan and Southern New England, these territories began as proprietary colonies, loyal to the crown and the Church of England. Many people of other cultures, religions, and races of the Atlantic world, notably Native Americans, Africans, and the French, lived in the region as well, leading to multicultural cooperation as well as conflict. But in addition to exploring the northern frontier, this project allows me to continue my work on witchcraft in several ways. First, I'm fascinated by protective and counter magic, as you probably have already figured out. But for example, daisy wheels were, were protective magic or white magic that Puritan clergy vehemently opposed because of its connection to Satan. Satan carries out magic, God does not. So how is it that we find these carved into Puritan gravestones, as well as decorative elements of fine oak furniture starting in the late 17th century? Well, the answer is complicated. But first, I think protective marks were somewhat hidden or could be hidden as decorations. Sometimes a daisy wheel is a pretty flower or could be passed off as such when appearing alongside roses, swirls, and other decorations. But I also believe such practices are physical evidence of the decline of Puritanism in the late 17th and 18th centuries. People became more concerned with protecting loved ones from evil, even deceased loved ones, than offending their minister. Related to this was the failure of the legal system and religious orthodox, uh, orthodoxy to protect people from the witches after 1692. Remember, people continued to believe in witches. They only stopped prosecuting because it became close to impossible to prove conviction, especially after Governor Phipps ruled out the use of spectral evidence. And as Increase Mather himself warned, better that 10 witches go free than the blood of a single innocent be shed. Indeed, it is clear that fear of witches persisted as can be seen in the evidence that is now regularly found in counter magical and protective magical markings and objects discovered in New England homes built in the 18th and even well into the 19th century. I suspect that pretty much every surviving New England home of those eras has some such protection. And it's just that people have not been looking for it or have not understood its significance. As one example, the Bridges House in North Andover, Massachusetts was relocated back in 2001. And in the process of the move, bottles and shoes were noted as being discovered near the central chimney. Now back then, they probably assumed the stuff was just junk. Now we know that the shoes were used to trap evil. And the bottles were likely witches' bottles. But perhaps the most interesting thing to me here is the fact that the bottles and shoes that were discovered were the types made in the mid-19th century, not back in 1721 when the house was built. So this is yet another example of many where protection was used in houses well into, if not through the 19th century. So belief in fear in witches and evil persisted. And in many ways, we still live in a magical world, right? Where, uh, think about this, every Christmas we put green wreaths on the door. And while that's a festive decoration, boughs of greenery were traditionally placed on thresholds and around doors to ward off evil. And nowadays at Christmas, it's only supposed to be good spirits that are expected to come down the chimney bearing gifts, placing them now in a stocking rather than a shoe. So I'm going to be exploring some of these things as well as other aspects of the witch trials as well in this project. And in part, I'll be doing it through studying probate inventories of people and families involved in the witch trials. And anyone who knows me knows, and any of my students know, that you're regularly afflicted with, uh, with probate inventories as assignments because I think they're just an underutilized resource. For those unfamiliar with them, probate inventories were the detailed lists of possessions along with their value made after a man's death as a way to determine his wealth and divide his assets amongst his heirs. They're truly remarkable resources that can provide pre precise details of material life down to the small things forgotten that James Dietz made famous. They give us a better sense of houses, possessions, and levels of wealth of people in 1692 which provides insights into their daily lives and their beliefs. Now, I should point out, particularly in the presence of Mary Beth, that under the patriarchal legal system of Puritan New England, women did not normally own property. So we don't have probate inventories for all those women afflicted or accused of witchcraft. And that's really unfortunate, but we can still learn a lot from their family members who did. So let me just give one example here. Thomas Putnam Jr. 
as we all know, was one of the villains of the witch trials, responsible for many of the accusations. Some historians attribute his actions to the fact that his father was one of the richest and most influential men in Salem Village. Yet Thomas Jr. lived in reduced economic circumstances and quite possibly reduced social status as well. It's kind of hard to tell. But his probate inventory certainly shows how this was true for the economics and perhaps for status. When his father died in 1699, he left an estate valued at 437 pounds, but with almost 200 pounds of debt. So unlike his father, it turns out he was a pretty average or median wealth for the day. And most of it was in his home, land, and livestock. He didn't have lots of fancy possessions like those witchcraft judges who were the wealthy merchants of Salem, right? Instead, Thomas's household possessions were simple and quite meager, including two pine chests. Note, not the fancy carved oak chest being made by Salem furniture makers either, the kind of ones we like to see at the Peabody Essex Museum. And he also owned an old cupboard. His one nice possession was a cane with a silver head. And I often wonder about it, right? Was it inherited from his father? Was it an embarrassing reminder of his reduced circumstances? Or did he splurge on it so that he could walk about with it, trying to maintain the pretense of wealth and position that had eluded him? Either way, I don't think many of us care too much for Thomas. Beyond probate inventories, I've even ventured in what we call experimental archaeology the experimental recreation of past lifeways based on surviving archaeological and documentary records. For me, this happens to be recreating and, of course, sampling 17th century recipes for ales, and that should come as no surprise to those who know me as well. But again, that's a story for another night. So, in conclusion, I've said it before and I'll say it again, there will never be a definitive book on the Salem witch trials. It is simply too complex and multifaceted a phenomenon, and the possibilities are almost endless. And like any good historical topic, it is a mirror that tells us perhaps as much about our current society as the event itself. For example, who would imagine we would be all be reading and hearing the term Salem witch hunt almost daily for the past of years to the point where even us scholars of it are sick of it. <laughs> so thank you, and particularly thank you, Don, and congratulations. Thank you very much, Ted. And next, we'll have Mary Beth Norton, who is the Mary Donlin Alger Professor of American History Emerita at Cornell University. She taught at Cornell from 1971 to 2018. And she was also the Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions at the University of Cambridge in 2005 and 6. She is the author of six very important books on early American history. I should say very important and very readable and engaging books on early American history, including Liberty's Daughters, The Revolutionary Experience of American Women, and of course, In the Devil's Snare, The Salem Witchcraft Crisis of 1692. And she is also one of the authors of A People and a Nation, which in 2018 appeared in its 11th edition, which is actually, it is one of the leading U.S. history textbooks since its publication in 1982. Her most recent work is 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. She is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and she, in 2018, was the president of the American Historical Association. So please welcome Mary Beth Norton. Thanks very much, Bob. And I should say I'm a very proud elected member, elected honorary member of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. And it's really lovely to be here to celebrate um, Don's presidency here uh, tonight. Uh, and my own brief contribution to this tribute to Don offers my answer to a question about the Salem trials that I didn't deal with in my book. So it's sort of like what Tad did. Um, although I thought about this, and here's the question that I'm going to talk about. Why have the so-called afflicted girls borne so much subsequent blame for what happened in Essex County in 1692? As a rising chorus of critics, then and later, sought to fix the blame for what within just a few years came to be seen as a dreadful miscarriage of justice, they had a number of possible options. They could have blamed the neighbors who witnessed against the accused and had long thought them to be witches. They could have blamed the justices of the peace or the judges. 
They could have blamed the grand or petty juries. They could have blamed the prosecutors. They could have blamed the colony's leading clergymen. They could have blamed those who confessed to being witches, many of whom implicated others. They could have blamed credulous adults who supported those who claimed to be attacked by specters. Instead, as soon happened, they blamed the so-called afflicted girls, all of whom were indeed afflicted, but not all of whom were girls. So that's what I want to talk about this evening. How did it come to happen that the afflicted girls come to be blamed for everything that happened? Now, those afflicted people in Salem Village and Andover, two of them men, largely ranged in age from 11 to the late 30s. Many, though not all, were single. Many, though not all, were servants. Some, though not all, were relatively recent arrivals in Salem Village. Two important ones were married women, one more respectable than the other, Anne Putnam Sr., the wife of Thomas Putnam Jr., who we've just heard about, and Sarah Vibber, who's not as respectable as Anne Putnam Sr., both of them, however, helped to convince judges and juries of the truth of younger women's claims of being attacked by witches in spectral form. Yet critics did not single them out, um, them or their male supporters. In fact, the very phrase afflicted girls seems to exclude them from consideration. Now, attempts to assess blame started even before the governor dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminer, which had tried the special court that had tried the witches. I'm sure everybody on this on this Zoom call knows that. Um, and before it was clear that the trials and executions had ended, on the 8th of October, Thomas Brattle, a wealthy Boston merchant and Harvard graduate, addressed a letter to a clergyman, perhaps Samuel Willard. I might add a little footnote here, which is that Cornell's witchcraft collection has acquired a 19th century transcript of the letter uh, of Thomas Brattle um, transcribed before it was ever published. So hmm. it's the, we just don't know what the origin of it is, but at my urging, Cornell's witchcraft collection now has it. And I would hope maybe somebody on this call might spend some time thinking about that document and how it came to be. Anyway, that's my footnote and a quest for somebody else to do some research. Um, now, this letter was clearly designed for a circulation among Boston's elite. Um, and it criticized the conduct of the trials. Brattle declared that judges, like other men, could make mistakes. He actually pulled few punches as he decried the judge's use of methods he termed sorcery to identify witches. He asserted that the confessors were deluded. That's his word. He questioned the reasoning that conflated specters with the individuals they purportedly resembled. And he wondered about the judge's refusal to arrest some prominent accused people. Now, in light of his hard-hitting language, it might seem that Brattle laid primary responsibility for the crisis squarely on the judges of the court of Oyer and Terminer and their allies. Yet, near the end of his letter, Brattle asserted that the judges were, quote, well-meaning men, end quote. He specifically praised William Stoughton, the zealous chief judge, honoring his, quote, wisdom and integrity while observing that the results of the trials were more a judgment on the colony as a whole, and I emphasize that, a judgment of, he said it's a judgment of the colony as a whole, rather than on Stoughton himself. As for the afflicted, he said, quote, the devil imposes upon their brains and deludes their fancy and imagination, end quote, and he called them these blind, nonsensical girls. Now, few later commentators followed Thomas Brattle's lead in voicing serious concerns about the conduct of the trials and the judge's questionable evaluation of the evidence. Instead, his deference toward the authorities and his uh, negative characterization of the afflicted young women set the tone for almost all subsequent statements about the events of 1692 for the next century. And of course, as we all know, beyond, because that's the image we all have today from numerable television and movie recreations of the trials of afflicted young girls. Now, the only assessment to omit any criticism of the afflicted accusers was actually the initial official declaration about the trials. In mid-December 1696, the Massachusetts Assembly actually employed the passive voice and diffused responsibility. The legislature expressed regret for, quote, whatever mistakes have been fallen into, end quote, and did not identify those who had fell, fallen into those mistakes. A month later, Samuel Sewell admitted that he was one of those who had fallen into the mistakes 
but he was the only judge who ever did that. 12 jurors and afflicted accusers and afflicted accuser and several witnesses followed in his footsteps. Nevertheless, commentators continued to refuse to blame even those few adult participants who like Sewell and the jurors blamed themselves. They, other people didn't pick that up. Now of the witnesses who rethought their roles, by far the most important was the Reverend Samuel, Hale, or sorry, John Hale of Beverly. As the pastor of a church in a town that bordered Salem town, Hale, as we all know, was an actual eyewitness to the fits of the afflicted, and he testified against three defendants. Yet he rethought his position in a lengthy treatise that he titled A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, which I might add the Cornell Witchcraft Collection has a copy of. Hale phrased the central question this way, quote, here was generally acknowledged to be an error, but the query is, wherein? That's his central question. So his answer was the judges had followed incorrect principles. Their error was not the misapplication of English precedents, but rather the precedents themselves. The trial judges bore little or no responsibility. Rather, responsibility lay with the English legal and religious treatises they had followed uncritically. So Hale moved the responsibility for the trials completely out of North America and over onto England, except for the afflicted girls because after he had excused the judges and by implication other witnesses like himself and the jurors, Hale did not show as much generosity to the afflicted accusers. He termed them, quote, demoniacs, which he um, italicized. And he proposed several different interpretations of their behavior, including that they had been faking. He doubted whether they actually were innocent victims who had accurately reported their visions asserting that their testimony about spectral afflictions was totally untrustworthy. Now in 1700, the merchant Robert Califf took a similar tack in his denigration of the afflicted. His main target was Cotton Mather, but in his ironically titled More Wonders of the Invisible World, Califf condemned the afflicted accusers in no uncertain terms. And in so doing, he firmly established what would become the dominant designation of responsibility for the trials. He attributed the debacle to, and I quote, the accusations of a parcel of possessed, distracted, or lying wenches, end quote. Whereas Hale had raised counterfeiting as a possibility, Califf insisted that the wenches, itself a contemptuous term, were distracted or lying, that's his phrase, having merely pretended to see specters. And significantly, he became the first to contend that, quote, the accusations of these from their spectral sight were the chief evidence against those that suffered. Nobody else had said that, that the afflicted were the, had presented the major evidence against the accused. Now the themes of Caliph's work repeat, re, reappeared repeatedly in comments on the witch trials after 1700. Petitions to the government, the Massachusetts government asking for the reversal of convictions and compensation for survivors relied heavily on the narrative he had developed. Even though you, that's surprising, but the petitions averred that, quote, certain possessed persons, end quote, had been the chief accusers. And though the trials had been filled with errors, the judges had acted with, quote, care and conscientious endeavor. Clearly, the people who are petitioning to the government want to not charge that other past members of the government, or in some cases, current members of the government had made mistakes. A group of survivors assured the legislature in 1709 that they did not blame judges or jurors. When Massachusetts responded in 1711 by reversing the convictions of most of those found guilty, the legislature officially attributed the tragedy to, quote, the evil spirits that influenced the principal accusers and witnesses. Now, such interpretations of the events of 1692 carried over into the first historical account of the witchcraft trials by the Englishman Daniel Neal in 1720. He remarked that he was surprised that the afflicted persons had not been publicly chastised in some way for their behavior. They had either willingly lied or they were lunatics. In either case, they should have been dealt with by the authorities, he said. So, the final one I'm gonna talk about is Thomas Hutchinson in his history of Massachusetts, who was even less inclined than Neil to grant the afflicted any kind of benefit of a doubt. He asserted that, quote, the whole was a scene of fraud and imposture begun by young girls. 
He admitted that adult confessors and credulous judges and juries bore some responsibility. He nevertheless placed the primary blame squarely on the afflicted accusers. Like Neil, he observed with some chagrin that, quote, none of the pretended afflicted were ever brought upon trial for their fraud. So this is another step in, in blaming the afflicted and arguing they should have been tried. So indeed, the responsibility has remained ever since on the so-called afflicted girls, which of course is an inaccurate term, rather than on the judges, juries, witnesses, governor, or other people on whom blame might have possibly fallen. Fixing attention on a limited number of accusers, the young afflicted female ones, not older male witnesses, and blaming them rather than all the other participants on the prosecution side of the trials added a distorted gender dimension to the proceedings. Now, the message to future generations was unmistakable. Women, especially young women, were not to be trusted in the public arena. What had gone wrong in 1692 Salem was not the fault of the learned adult men who composed the court. No, women were responsible for the tragic failure of justice, precisely because they were irresponsible participants in public discourse. Such a conclusion fully accorded with new notions of the proper roles of men and women that were taking shape during the same decade on the other side of the Atlantic. And I'm gonna put a plug from one of my books. I discussed in my detail in my 2011 book, Separated by Their Sex, Women in the Public and Private in the Colonial Atlantic World, to which I refer anyone interested in the aftermath of the Salem story and the results of the, the blaming of young women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. And I should just point out that Mike Saunders has volunteered to help with research. And Amanda Chestnut is forming a band called Distracted Wenches. So thank oh, you for that. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, next, we have Ben Ray, who is a professor emeritus of religious studies at the University of Virginia. And he taught there for 25 years. He also was the adjunct curator of African art at the UVA University Art Museum. And in his long and distinguished career, he also taught at Dartmouth, Barnard, Princeton, and Makerere University in Uganda. His books include Satan and Salem, The Witch Hunt Crisis of 1692, records, and he was associate editor of the records of the Salem Witch Hunt and co-editor of A Magic Still Dwells, Comparative Religion in the Postmodern Age, as well as Myth, Ritual, and Kingship in Buganda. He's been a consultant to documentaries on the witch trials for the National Park Service's Visitor Center in Salem and for the National Geographic Network. He has written numerous articles and done extraordinary presentations on the Salem crisis, including writing the introduction to Arthur Miller, Las Brujas de Salem, which was published in Madrid in 2007, and mapping the Salem witch trials using GIS. And he is the director of the Salem witch trials documentary archive. So thank you for joining us, Ben Ray. Thank you very much. And Don, congratulations. I'm missing seeing you on the screen, but I know you're there. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again, uh, perhaps in Maine. We're all eager uh, to get out to our summer places. I'm gonna call on Mary Blunt, if she will, um, put up, the Salem Witch Trials Documentary Archive website. Thank you, Mary. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to present a, a dynamic uh, geographical display of over time of the extent territorially by community and so forth of the Salem Witch Trials, which as Mary Beth has suggested already in her book, ought to be called really the Essex County Witch Trials because um, there, it involved 24 different communities besides Salem Village where it started. And I'm going to ask Mary if she would, uh, thank you for that map and click on that, if it will work. And open it up. It's not opening. It's not opening. Um, let's just see. Oh. 
I can jump in here. And try to rescue this. Um, this is going to be a little awkward, but Mary, maybe you could um, uh, go click off the website, then click on refresh it. In other words, maybe just click refresh that page might help. Don't worry, <laughs> I'm here. I'm going to have to do this. Um, Mary, maybe you would click off that so I can. We can come on full screen with me. There you go. There you go. Oh, well done. Excellent. Uh, it's not blue, it's green, but... Good, thank you. Now, what is going on here in this map is a progress bar. We can click Stop any time uh, on the pause button there, Mary. There you go. Do you see the pause button, which is down below? Good. Now, what you can see here, oh, fine, is the um, a kind of spread like an academic, like an epidemic. Um, in fact, two people involved at the time referred to this as a plague-like phenomenon. It, it spread um, almost exponentially from its small origins in Salem Village uh, to cover a good deal of Essex County. And we haven't quite up here. Why don't you continue with the play button? And you can see Andover going berserk there. Um, and there's a reason for that. And I wanted to take the rest of the time to talk about that reason. Um, why don't we run through this map again, Mary, just to get a sense. You can back up, pull it back, and uh, pause if you would right there. Thanks. We see... Um, the first three uh, accused are uh, occurring in Salem Village. Mary, if you'll take your cursor and go up to the top left to the plus sign and click on that and then grab the map uh, with there. Thank you. Oh, perfect. And then we'll run it again through the end of May, if you would. Now, all the time, there is no governor. There is no charter. Stop right there, please. Thank you. You can see by the end of May, there are a total of 69 people in jail accused. Um, and at this time, all that was going on legally was the magistrate's court in Salem. This is not a court, a trial court. Uh, which had to be instituted, Mary Beth alluded to this, the court of Oye and Termine, once the governor came and he could set up a court. But you can see the sort of crisis already that he faced, not knowing <laughs> that anything like this was going on when he and uh, Increase Mather jumped off the ship and landed in Boston. And this is what they were hit with. Uh, they instituted the court at the end of May, and its first trial uh, was Bridget Bishop at the beginning of June. And then there was a pause. If you can play, click the play button again. Thank you. And then stop right there. Good. For a space of time, for about two weeks, there are no trials. There's only one 
trial and there is a conviction of Bridget Bishop. Um, and there is a halt in the court's activities to give the ministers, Mary Beth is talking about who to blame here, um, give the ministers a chance to evaluate the court's activity and respond. But the ministers were in a hampered position because they were no longer in charge of the state. It was the uh, government of the new 1691 charter, which arrived officially with the governor's middle of May, 1692. So um, the ministers could only say, well, uh, you're doing a good job, but watch out for spectral evidence because that can get the better of you and you can't control it. But otherwise, go ahead, pr prosecute those witches and seek them out. Um, and then if you'd hit the play button again, Mary, thank you. And it did go on. Uh, and you can see the growing numbers and the spread. And it goes right through. Uh, why don't we run through November and stop it there, please? Okay, now this map is showing a total of 151, the lower right side people accused and in jail. The number is actually higher, but I've not put the, those people in there because it's uncertain where the last five or six people that we know of belong are located. Um, and notice which months are the most active and where things begin to zoom up exponentially. And it's between March and April and right in there, uh, as Mary Beth's book beautifully points out, is the accusation of George Burroughs. And then you can see things take off. Burroughs, the reprobate, <laughs> reprobate uh, minister, has uh, become the leader of Satan's efforts and against um, not only Salem Village, but eventually against churches everywhere. And um, May becomes very active. Uh, it slows down in June, but then the courts resume again, July, August, September. And September ends with a flourish of eight um, executions on Gallows Hill. So um, the extent of this is, is rather awesome. Mary uh, Blunt, if I can ask you to bring your cursor up to the top left and click on the minus button so we can see. And there way up in Wells, Maine is where they dragged George Burroughs from his church there down um, to for trial. Now, <clears throat> why is Andover the big blowout place? And it has to do with the fact that there were most people there who were accused were people who confessed. Now, this is an, the oddest quirk and characteristic of the Salem witch trials is that no one who confessed to witchcraft, to being a witch and describing at length how they were baptized by the devil and so on, no one was executed who claimed that. They claimed it because near the beginning, in fact, right at the beginning, it has to do with the confession by Tichuba, the slave, the enslaved um, Caribbean uh, Native American Indian um, in his household. And at her uh, first preliminary examination, when she began to confess, it was noted by Samuel Paris, he wrote a deposition, that the afflicted girls that Mary Beth's talking about stopped. They were not afflicted during her confession. Before her confession, they were, the moment she stopped, they stood there motionless. And then Paris became the 
court appointed recorder for the next three confessions of uh, Abigail Hobbs, of her mother, Deliverance Hobbs, and Mary Warren. And he noted again, these were three, three people who confessed in April. Once the confessions began, the afflictions stopped. So um, I thought, this is puzzling. What's going on here? So uh, what I did, and I'm going to ask uh, Mary Blunt, if you would um, go back to the website so you can click out of this page and just get back to the, there we go. And then, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, go to the court records, if you will. Thank you. Okay, that's great. And uh, um, what happened was that I did some keyword searches because all the documents text are in uh, digital form and I could search for some keywords. So I used those first words that Samuel Paris wrote in his deposition. The girls, the uh, afflictions left off uh, attacking the girls. So left off is the words I used. I searched on those and found 15 more uh, instances where during an interrogation with the girls present, there was a confession and they stopped. And this meant, as Paris had pointed out, the, the confessors were harmless. They were never put in shackles. They were kept in prison. This was the, but they were not executed. Near the end, Stoughton was trying to haul more people into execution. So he did put five confessors on trial and they were uh, rescued by the governor at that time who knew he had to stop this craziness and they were um, all reprieved. Uh, but the bulk of them, all 55 of them, uh, which is one third of the people who uh, were accused and jailed, uh, were never put on trial. And not only that, um, they were required to give evidence uh, by naming names of other witches. This accelerated the, the, the arrests and pushed on the trials because the court believed the confessors are pointing to people. They now need to be arrested. They confess and point to more people so Mary Beth, I use a statistic from your book, the number of people named by people who confessed. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful uh, tabulation of that. So I added them all up. Um, there was an awful lot of work there and it runs to some, over 200 people. Um, so you can imagine there's this generating engine of confession, um, and, and the requirement to be a legitimate confessor is to name names. And that generates more court activity and seems to confirm the court. So I'm just working on a paper on this subject. Um, I think it's kind of one of the unex unexplored features of the Salem witch trials that if um, it works out, explains a lot of what happened. Thanks, Mary Glenn, for your help. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ben and Mary Beth and Ted. Uh, before I venture into questions that we've been getting from the audience, I wonder if any of you would like to respond to what your colleagues have said. Well, it sounded good to me. 
<laughs> Excellent. I think we might as well wait for comments from the audience or questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, here there have been a number of very interesting ones. Um, one says that you know this is a horrific event, and yet the city of Salem. I, I think the Salem town fathers probably say a novena every night, thanking God that this happened. Um, what is it that makes it into? Is there a tension between this big historical event and tourism as a thing? Is that I mean, Ted, you're in Salem every October, so you see what it's like. And it's, so I wonder if you could just comment a little bit about that. Why is this such a fascinating thing? And is that a problem, I guess? Sure. I mean, well, I, as my short answer is, is that Gallows Hill casts a long, dark, lasting shadow over Salem. Uh, the, the tourist industry really began in earnest uh, at the 200th anniversary in 1892, when they commercially started selling things under the uh, you know, like um, which city codfish cakes and soap and things like that. So people have been commercializing Salem for a long, long time in Salem, right? It's one thing when someone from London or Boston makes fun of you, but it's another when you're using it to make money. And that has not sat well with people in Salem for a long time. It's very conflicted. And today, even with it being kind of like the Halloween haunted capital of the world um, is, is, again, is really kind of a burden. Many people in, in, in Salem from 1692 were ashamed of what happened and wanted to make amends. And that's still very much true today. And some people find that harder to do uh, with all of this going on. On the other hand, Salem is a typical New England post-industrial city. It makes a lot of its money off of tourism and it provides a lot of jobs. So it's, a, it's one of these complex issues. Um, I do like to think that in many ways, I, I like to think that the work that, that Ben and I and the rest of the Gallows Hill team did to uh, confirm the execution site on Proctor's Ledge. Uh, what may, may I hope is, is symbolic of somewhat of a new start. Uh, what I say is like, you know, more sort of uh, commemoration in October and less what I call sort of, you know, the, the uh, sort of the, the, the vampire fangs and fried dough mentality that persists. Um, and I do think what was really important there too was that the city has owned this um, the, the past few years since when Ben and I went, when we went to the mayor, we were kind of like apologetic or didn't know how to take it that we'd found this and didn't know what the reaction would be and from the and or how we would fund a memorial that we that was needed and from the get-go mayor driscoll and the whole city rallied behind us even those people who had this found this in their backyard and said no this is the city's responsibility we take ownership we need we need to do this and do this right so um it's 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 a, it's still an issue but one i think that salem is gradually coming to grips with, and I hope, I hope we'll see continual improvement in the future. Thank you. Someone wanted to know, where was Samuel Paris's parsonage? Is that something you can show us or tell us? Um, you can find it, actually go to, to the internet. That's the yeah. simplest okay. to do. And it will pull up a map, or at least it's easy to do if you go to MapQuest and pull up Salem and then you'll see a big uh, marker uh, thanks to um, uh, Richard Trask who did the excavations and uh, it's actually very accessible. It's, it's easy to find because it's marked with a big, um, you know, big uh, sign, yeah. sign yeah. And, oh, okay. it, and on the internet there it's it's labeled. Basically. It's in somebody's backyard, though. <laughs> I, I go up a little narrow alleyway, uh, walking there. No, you can't drive up, or shouldn't drive up. And uh, there it is. It's a, a wonderful thing. You get the sense of ground zero. I, think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I make I make a point of driving into Salem every day that way, and you get <laughs> off State ninety five, head east on the Center Street exit, and it's about half or three quarters of a mile on your left. You have to kind of look because it is. You're right, Ben. It's about a hundred, couple hundred feet in off the road. But it was. You're right. It's ground zero. It was the middle of Salem Village because oh. you had the parsonage and the minister right there in 1692. And of course, it's in Danvers now. And I, um, I took a class there um, a f some years ago. I took. I had a. I for years I taught a Sem Sal Salem witchcraft seminar, and I took a group of Cornell students there, and we went and. And look to see the, you know, the original site of Paris's um, home and so forth. So it was, they had a, they had a very interesting time on that trip. And they were uh, struck by, as you said, Tad, the 
post-industrial city nature of Salem, they all had this image of it as a rural village, <laughs> which was really funny, kind of funny to me, but that's what they thought of, or some of them thought of it that way. Okay, a couple of folks have asked about what happens to the victims who lost property or reputation. Is there ever any compensation for them? Any kind of truth or reconciliation commission? Uh, well, I can answer there. Yes, there was this attempt by Massachusetts to, in fact, um, compensate people who uh, petitioned or whose families petitioned. And the family of George Burroughs, who's already been mentioned here several times, was the most avid. They were still petitioning for further compensation in 1750. And I might add that I had a student uh, in my class who was a descendant of George Burroughs. Um, it was his, his middle name was Burroughs. Wow. Um, and he, he, was, he was, known in the, it was known in the family that he was a descendant of Burroughs. But yes, there were a number, uh, there were many people who were compensated and then there were other people who were not. But if I can also plug, let me just plug this, the Cornell Witchcraft Collection website. If, you, if anyone wants to Google the Cornell Witchcraft Collection, you will get on the website. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link that says student research. And I once had a student in that seminar who actually examined with great care all the um, requests for compensation and what happened to them. So it's a very good paper, about 15 pages long written several years ago, and so anybody could do that. You can find any of the works that my students did in that class, which I thought were brilliant, many of them. They are really good. Bob, if I could just add to that, I think, um, you know, I think the, the, the chief villain in Salem, well, maybe there's several, but one of them certainly is William Stoughton, yeah. because it was uh, after, of course, uh, he eventually ends up being uh, acting governor after Phipps dies, and uh, as long as Stoughton is alive and in, in ruling Massachusetts, there will be no reparations or no consideration of pardons. Even mm -hmm. after 1697, when they have the, the Sewell's apology and, and the day of, of, of fasting and thanksgiving, nothing happens. But it, after, only after Stoughton dies is it even, is it, that is considered by the legislature. So, and, and by the way, I'm going to learn a lot more about this, I hope, when uh, our, our friend uh, Margot Burns Yes. <laughs> uh, publishes her biography that she's working on, on William Stoughton. Mm. Yeah. He's, he's one of the most fascinating characters in this whole process. And we're all dying. We're dying for you to finish that book, Margo. And it's very tough because his papers don't survive. Mm. It does make it. Which is uh, not so shocking, is it? <laughs> <laughs> A couple of just people. Like, just like Paris's papers, except for yes. his sermons. They, yeah. I think they were deliberately destroyed by him or his his family. A couple of people have asked if there were any descendants still around of any of the, uh, you mentioned Burroughs, but. Oh yeah. The, people turn up all the time in my talks and say they, I ask, I've, I've come to ask at the beginning of my talks on Salem, are there any witch descendants in the audience? And there are usually several. Hmm. And I'm a witch descendant. Really? I'm a descendant of Mary Bradbury who was convicted, but not hanged because her husband was too prominent. Wow. And Where the, jur the, the jailer was bribed and she got out of jail and, and skedaddled and reemerged re only after everything was over. But yes, I'm a direct descendant of Mary Bradbury. Roger, well, while, we're talking about, yeah, quite yes, while we're talking about descendants. Yeah, uh, there you are. <laughs> I'm a descendant of the Ray family, which I never knew until I went to Danvers and went to um, the Rebecca Nurse Homestead and in the, the cemetery there, graveyard is a monument to the 38 or 39 people who signed on behalf of her good character. And there turned out to be four rays, R-E-A. Um, there, you can't choose who your ancestors are. However. That's very true. Uh, a couple of people have asked about a financial motive to get property away from people as behind some of the allegations. No. I see some shaking heads it's and some almost, nodding heads. It's almost as bad as ergot. Um, yeah, it's a myth. The, the, uh, and, and, but there is the, the, the nugget of truth there is that uh, there, you, during this time, because you were actually under, under English common law rather than Massachusetts law, uh, as they tried to work a new set of laws for the chart for the new charter of 1691, um, 
it was legal for the sheriff to seize the personal property of felons. That's things like your livestock, your clothes, your sword, stuff like that. But you could never, ever, ever alienate from a felon his real estate, his land and property that would go unrestricted to heirs. And by the way, then as now, it's the state that benefits always, right? That there was no finder's fee for turning in a witch either. So there was no real sort of personal gain involved. That doesn't say that there weren't petty differences amongst neighbors. And they may have had grievances with their neighbors, but they, there was no direct profit motive, no. Someone asked how come we don't see allegations in some towns like Watertown, they mentioned, or other places. Why doesn't it spread to other places? You, you, it's extraordinary how far it did spread, but why not some places? Well, why not is that every community is percolating, you know, with one kind of neighborly resentment or another. Uh, but you had to get the attention, um, you know, whatever was going on in between neighbors, you had to get the attention of the judicial system to do that, to, to you know, get redress or so on, get it brought to court. And you had to have those girls, Mary Beth, yeah, those girls in Salem Village had to become afflicted yeah. by one of those neighbors who was complaining about the other neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, witchcraft, very much like my African studies in small villages, is a matter of um, misfortune and trying to explain misfortune, all right? right? And many misfortunes that you see in the records in the Salem trials um, are the death of young children's or children or infants. Mm -hmm. And doctors, physicians, such as, you know, we had them then, were often, you know, unable to point to any cause. Right. And if someone brought to the attention to the physician, this is in the records, by the way, too, in a number of cases, why did the question, why did my infant, you know, child die? And it could very well be witchcraft. The, and that was great. You know, Dr. Briggs, who was the physician who pointed that out. So um, it's, it's um, small community resentments which get the attention uh, of people who are going to bring it into the court. And that happened in some places and didn't happen in, in others. Now, were there any men accused or was this strictly gendered? I'm just answering that question that came up in the chat. Um, yes. yes, definitely men were accused. In fact, if you take the number of men accused versus the, num the proportion of men who were hanged and compare that to the number of women accused and the number of women who were hanged, a higher proportion of men who were accused were convicted and hanged than women were. And that's one of the really interesting things about the Salem trials is because we tend to think of it as a set of trials of accused women, but in fact, there were a bunch of men, very important men who were accused, like George Burroughs, and who were hanged, like George Burroughs. And that's pretty much typical, around 25% or so of, of, of people accused of witchcraft throughout time and place are male. Mm -hmm. um, so it certainly is a, a female dominated crime, um, you know, and throughout, Mary Beth should be saying this, not me, but you know, if, Women were considered by most of these patriarchal societies to be the weaker vessel, more mm -hmm. susceptible to Satan's wiles. Right. Um, and it's even worse than a 75-25 split because a majority of men who were accused were friends, neighbors, family members, defendants mm -hmm. of those women who were accused, which is somehow they got accused. Sons of or husbands or whatever, but mm -hmm. not always. And I would add, there actually is a jurisdiction that is a country in which most of the accused witches were men. And I think it might be Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but it's a Europe, it's a central European country in which there were more men accused. Are you, are you, is it, is it, in Russia, at one, in the early days in study in Russia, it was predominantly male, but they then, uh, and there's a really good book on that. What is it called? In the bathhouse, at, uh, at the bathhouse at midnight. Mm -hmm. But it turns out when they expanded the pool of cases, 
it became more like what we're accustomed to, but I, you may well be right, Mary Beth. Yeah, it's in, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the author. It's in the name of that. It's in the book by the, the guy who wrote the um, very comprehensive history of European witchcraft and whose own specialty is France. And I've met him, but I'm totally yeah. blanking his name. It's out of print now, that book. I used to use it in my class yeah. long ago. <laughs> I, I wonder if you could just sketch for us briefly what's happening with witchcraft as a phenomenon in this period. We focus on Salem, but we know there's a lot more going on, particularly in Europe, just to fill people in. Well, this is the end. Uh, this is the last, except for a, uh, an episode in Scotland a few years later, this is really the last of the major witchcraft trials in Europe. Now this, or in, in the Western world, this does not prevent people from believing in witchcraft as um, Tad has pointed out, people still believed in it. They just didn't try people for it. And they, if they did, they didn't execute people for it. Um, one of the cases that I've particularly been interested in, which I didn't write about because it's in Virginia, is a woman in Virginia in the early 18th century who all her neighbors think is a witch. And they keep testing her and trying her and they decide they've proved that she's a witch and they keep sending the case up to the General Court of Virginia and the, and the judges say, no, you don't have enough evidence. So they send it back down. So they try again, they throw her in the water to see if she swims, they do this, they do that. Um, they never get her executed or convicted because the authorities in Virginia are very skeptical. Do the girls, uh, not to just focus on the girls since Mary Beth told us that was a mistake. Um, did they have afflictions that we can identify medically? <laughs> Many people have tried to argue that in one way or another. Um, I decided not to do any psychologizing in my book. Other people have. Tad didn't do it either. Um, some people have. Um, it's definitely not ergot. Although I have to say, one of my students produced the best argument for ergot I've ever seen. It's on that website at the Cornell Witchcraft Collection. Um, he was a senior in plant pathology who took the mm. class specifically so he could investigate, um, mat, you know, fungus uh, <laughs> ergot, oh. and ergot poisoning. Um, but no, I, um, it, it's not encephalitis. Some people say it's encephalitis. Some people say it's epilepsy. None of those things work. None of those mm. things work. And I argue in my book that what we need to see the, the fifths in Salem as is as a continuation of a tradition that goes back into 17th century England and earlier in 17th century America of children in extremely pious households having fits, which seem to be brought on by religious pressures um, brought on them to express their conversion experiences or whatever. And at least that's the way it seems to start. But beyond that, who knows? I, um, uh, uh, one of our viewers in Framingham wants to know about uh, Salem End Road in Framingham. And the story is that this is where people fled from Salem. Do you, can you cast any light on that? Bad knows. Um, yeah, Salem End is, uh, is, is actually where Sarah Cloyce and her family moved to after 1692 on land actually given to them by Judge Danforth, who I think probably felt very sorry for them. And of course, uh, Sarah had lost her, her two sisters, uh, Mary and, and Rebecca Nurse, um, to the witch, to were executed for witchcraft. So we think what at least about 50, 60, 70 members of that extended family moved to, to Salem, uh, Salem End, that part of western part of Framingham in the 1690s, and some of their houses still survive. Um, the house that was long considered to be Sarah's house, we now know was actually built on the property she and her husband owned, but was not built until oh, probably like around the time of the American Revolution, I think. Mm. Um, but that's certainly true. And in fact, actually, there was a diaspora out of Salem where families went in all different directions, accused accusers, even, even judges, uh, changed their names, left, uh, got out as best they could. Someone asked about the impact of the wars with the Native people on the main frontier and what impact that had in, <laughs> on this episode. Well, it had, a, and I argue that it had a lot of impact. Um, I, I think that the, um, the um, climate of fear that the war in Maine created had an enormous impact on uh, people's, um, 
people's psyche, uh, if I can put it that way. I mean, one of the things you see in the testimonies of the accused and accusers alike is an awareness of what's going on in Maine and um, um, uh, dreams of uh, Indians doing things that to them and to other people. And also um, uh, many, of, not many, but some of those young women who were indeed afflicted came from Maine and had experienced traumatic experiences as young people during the wars. And I was able fortunately to trace some of those experiences uh, for example, Mercy Lewis, who was one of the leading accusers and was a servant in the house of the Putnams, um, was from a family where all, literally all of her family, except for a couple of cousins, had been wiped out in the Indian Wars, and she clearly had been traumatized by it. She also had had prior experience of working for George Burroughs, so mm. she's a key person in my mind. In the, in the eyes of the uh, Puritans, were the Indians practicing magic? The Puritans thought the Indians were practicing magic. The Indians thought they were doing their religious rituals. Yeah. You know, it's just a hey, different. You're, you're a religious professor. What do you What do you think about yeah. Native, Native American religion filter into this? Uh, well, it's um, perspective, isn't it? Um, it's uh, take the Catholics and the Protestants. I mean, from a Protestant point of view, the Catholics are practicing magic in the mass, and it's. It's um, a term uh, used to denigrate almost any, any uh, other religion than yours. Now magic, I want, you know, that was Tad Broach on that. And there's two kinds of magic. There's sympathetic magic, uh, like affecting like, and there's the magic of contagion or part affects the whole. Uh, light affecting, like affecting light, uh, the word poppet comes to mind, and that's a, a image of someone uh, made from bits of cloth or wax and a pin is stuck into it. So it's, it's literally, um, well, by uh, what you do is uh, to be sympathetically transferred to the person you're doing it to. So it, and there's the um, Salem documents are full of that. If you just search on certain key words, you can find it all over the place. Interesting. A couple of you have alluded to this, but we know about the loss of the charter in the 1680s, the collapse of the old government. What impact does all of that have? Does that lead to uncertainty in this in the 1690s. You know, Increase Mather always was able to predict things that were going to happen and after they had happened. And he said, I saw all of this coming because it happened in the 1680s. Can you speak any more about that? Uh, well, it's hard, you know, you can, I, I only have a short thing to say on it. I'm sure everybody can jump in, but um, there is the framework of explanation. So one framework is Salem Village and microcosm, the preaching by the Samuel Paris and the uh, uh, objections to him and cutting off his salary and cutting off his winter firewood and you know a division within the village and, and uh, it's directed at Paris and it foments amongst the children in his household. That's one level. But then there's a, a broader level uh, that many people have pointed to is a kind of instability, uncertainty um, of this period. It's between the charters and then the new charter uh, that comes and they already know a little bit about what that contains before uh, Phipps arrives. It's uh, dethroning a little bit the Puritan hegemony, um, the dominant. So Puritanism is is not intended to be the dominant religion anymore. And, and uh, there's the increasing of the franchise, spreading out of the floating franchise. This is all kind of in the air even before um, the breakout. So you can talk about political uncertainty, but 
I'm enough of an anthropologist where I like to go to the village where it's happening and talk about people who are doing other things to people and who are they and what's, you know, what's going on. But you can look at it in a macro or micro level. Uh, we have a number of, I, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, someone wanted to ask about the Mathers, but a number of people have asked, the big question is, what does this mean to us today? Or what can we learn from this today? And I'm sure this is a question each of you has answered. And let me just recommend for those who are asking very good specific questions about what happened, the place to start would be in um, Ben Ray's book, Satan and Salem, Tad Baker's book, A Storm of Witchcraft, and Mary Beth's In the Devil's Snare. So that's your reading after tonight. <laughs> and now I'll just ask our three panelists what we learn about all of this and how it applies to today. Well, as, as we were told, um, uh, we've certainly heard, we were reminded by Tad, we've certainly heard a lot about witch hunts lately. And um, I think that um, it does mean we shouldn't um, rush to judgment, but it also means that I think the witch trials have served as a, ever since, as a kind of a, um, a template that people can use um, when they want to challenge something that they don't like. It's like um, former President Trump claiming that the, uh, the um, investigations of him were a witch hunt. But it's like Arthur Miller, who in The Crucible really draws an explicit or almost explicit analogy between the witch trials and the McCarthy period, McCarthy hearings, and or um, uh, the people in um, the 1980s who were concerned about attacks on, um, on um, uh, daycare centers. Um, seeing that what happened then too was a witch hunt. So I, I think it's become a sort of a standard analogy um, as for, and it means we just have to be careful about drawing analogies, I would guess. And I, I, I'd ask uh, Ben and uh, Tad to comment too. <laughs> well, um, yeah, my two cents. Um, it's, it's a good thing to have this as a model, uh, a reference point in our own history. A reminder how badly society can go off the rails, mm -hmm. uh, how prejudice and feelings of insecurity. After all, this is the big Satan yeah. um, here trying to undermine um, uh, the society and community. And w we Americans tend to have that fear and we want to blame someone uh, as part of that. Uh, uh, effort to undermine our society. So it, it, it does remind us, I think, of how, when we think about it, how fragile things really are, uh, that it comes up and is a paradigm in our own history. I, I agree with everything everyone said. I, uh, when I teach the Salem Witch Trials, I teach it almost as much as a, as a social justice course, as a history course. And I, and I think to some degrees is what really always bothers me is, is this talk about how stupid these people were or how superstitious they were. Like, no, they were not superstitious. Witchcraft was real. They were just as smart as we were. Just because we don't understand them doesn't make them dumb. Right. And particularly, my point is like, imagine that witches are real. They are going, they want to destroy our society, kill our families, destroy our faith, end it all. And we can't stop them because we're not sure who they are. So how do we do that? Well, our government says it's trying to help us and they'll figure it out, but what do they really know? How can they really do that, right? Who's gonna help us? Who's gonna stop this? Now, my point is if you swap the word witch in 1692 with a word like terrorist today, a threat that is absolutely real. And again, I'm not saying terrorism is not real, it's horrible, but people in 1692 really absolutely, witchcraft was a real uh, medical affliction, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about the uncertainty and fear that we suffer whenever, you know, if, if you hear a loud noise, you don't think much about it. Then if you hear a siren going off, uh, I don't know. Then if you hear ambulances and you see smoke, mm -hmm. occasionally you go to that worst places. Maybe, wow, is that, is that a terrorist? What's going on, right? And people in the 17th century lived with that constant, constant fear about witches. So I think to some degrees, the lesson is like, you know, I, I think there's some universals here about the human condition. 
that we'd, we'd be wise to, to pay attention to and you know not rush to judgment. And, and let me just comment on that, that uh, one of the things that's true about the 17th century, and we've already sort of talked about it, but not said it specifically, is that there were many unexplained things that happened. Today, we have explanations for things like uh, when somebody gets a cold, we say, oh, he caught a virus. Or when somebody gets, I don't know, pneumonia, we have antibiotics to treat that that problem. But um, in the 17th century, when that child became ill and you couldn't e explain it, witchcraft becomes the default explanation, which is the way I've already ta always talked about it. it when there's no, there's no germ theory of disease, nobody knows why any of these things are happening, and but they're happening. And so you attribute the horrible things to malevolent witches who um, you've been arguing with or who you fear anyway in your town. I mean, one of the conclusions I came to as a result of my, my study was that I believe that every small New England village had its witch. And that person might have maybe practiced fortune telling or, or just have been um, called a witch by other people. But in any event, um, the belief in witchcraft was so widespread that when um, something bad happened, there were, there were potential people around to blame. And th those were the witches. And they went on for years. It went on for years and years. And it was not and one of the other points I make in that book and in another one is that oftentimes it took many years from an initial accusation before somebody was actually formally accused and tried. There would be gossip going on behind the scenes. Oh, don't you know that Goody X um, uh, put a curse on my cow and so it died, you know, that sort of thing, um, rather than, um, and, then, and then those things added up over the years. Yeah, it's scapegoating and it's always there. And, the, and as John Demos talks about this in Entertaining Satan, at times of tension in society, those accusations that are always there like, you know, I really think Bridget Bishop is a witch. And in fact, in 1680, she was accused, right? But she got off the hook. But then in 1692, people start looking around for the usual suspects. Right. And there she is, right? There she is, yeah. Well, right. just to put two cents in, social media is full of suspicion now and uh, alternative explanations. And we're seeing the emphasis on believe the science. Well, um, there's, that's because there's so many other kinds of thinking out there and um, just as in 1692. Very true. And uh, Bob, somebody's yeah. asked, will this be available? To yes. Speak Speaking of social media, yes, this will be recorded and will be available on our website as well as our Facebook page. So thank you all. Thank you all for being part of this wonderful discussion. You know, we thought of the Donald Friary lecture, but this has been a conversation. I think now we know how to go forward with it. So thank you all for helping to inaugurate this. Thank you for everyone who joined us this evening and sent in your questions and your comments. And thank you again to Don Friary for his leadership of the Colonial Society. And thank you to Mary Beth Norton, Ben Ray, and Tad Baker for uh, an extraordinary discussion of Salem 1692 and beyond. So thank and, you all. And thank Just, you, Don, again, again. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. And asking such good questions. Yeah.